Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for a special edition of the Majeska Simpkins School of Human Rights. Of course, I'm Dr. Robert Green II, and I am pleased and thrilled that this evening we'll be showing a wonderful documentary about the life and legacy of Majeska Simpkins. Of course, every year when we offer the Majeska Simpkins School of Human Rights, we usually show this documentary at the beginning of the semester, but we wanted to make sure that we did show it um, before we got too far into our lessons for the year. Um, now, of course, today is April 1st, 2024. Um, this week is a week of numerous anniversaries in American history. Uh, today is the anniversary of the Battle of Five Forks in 1865, which led to the collapse of the Confederate Army around Appomattox Courthouse. Um, April 4th is, of course, the anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in 1968. Uh, again, incredibly important dates in American and world history. But tonight, we are here to honor the life and legacy of Majestic Simmons, of the woman after whom our School of Human Rights is named. And I think for a lot of us in the room, we know a thing or two about mm -hmm. Mrs. Simpkins, but as you'll see in this documentary, there is a hell of a lot more to know about Majestic Simpkins. Uh, I can say that when I was in graduate school at the University of South Carolina, I was privileged and fortunate enough to actually listen to some oral history recordings of Jessica Simpkins giving interviews. And uh, let's just say those were some rather colorful interviews. And they really taught me a lot about how historical figures um, are very complicated people. Uh, and Jessica Simpkins was certainly one of those individuals. But what you're going to see tonight is someone who was involved in every single human rights campaign there was to be involved in the 20th century. If there was a fight for justice, justice, Mrs. Simpkins was there on the front lines. If there was a fight for freedom, she was doing whatever she could to make sure that fight was won. And by the end of this evening, I believe you'll come away from the documentary with an even, even greater appreciation for Jessica Simpkins' life and legacy. Now, the best thing about tonight's presentation is that we are honored and privileged to also have with us another champion of freedom and justice in South Carolina, uh, Ms. Ms. Beryl Dackers, who is, of course, a great, great journalist for ETV, um, has done a lot for the arts here in South Carolina. I can't really say it better than Leo Twiggs did once when he said that, quote, if the arts could talk, they would sound like Beryl Dackers. Her voice is legendary and her style is extraordinary, end quote. And I mean, it's, it's a quote from Leo Twiggs. I had to read it. I'm sorry. I'm not putting on the spot here, but I am putting on the spot. So, <laughs> uh, and also on a personal note, I've had the privilege and fortune to work with her on a variety of initiatives, whether it's the Friends of African American Art and Culture at the Columbia Museum of Art, or currently on the board of directors for the South Philadelphia Library where Beryl is our fearless leader. 
Um, so I do want to uh, first welcome Beryl Dacker to tonight's school, and she will talk a bit about the program as well. So let's give Beryl a warm round of applause. You want me to talk first? No, she will answer questions if you okay. want to grill her now. No, no, we can do questions. <laughs> but well, but, but uh, I, hey, I did I didn't say that he did. So. Uh, but what we are going to do this evening is watch the documentary. Uh, as as you're watching it, feel free to take notes. Um, feel free to think about what you're seeing here, and then afterwards we'll have a Q and A session with Beryl about the making of the documentary. And this would be a great chance for us to talk about just how heavily involved Jessica Simpkins was in a wide range of movements. Well, Robert, let me ask her, because she has anything you think that would contribute to setting it up, the era, the time, you, what you were doing, the year it was, or just go and then talk about it later? Well, let me say to you first and foremost, I'm really honored that you would be interested in looking at this film, which is almost 34 years old. And so it, it it says a lot that we feel it is still relevant and an important thing uh, for us to be acquainted with. That's that's very meaningful to me, and I think it would be to Jessica as well. I'll also tell you that I'll say something about my relationship with Jessica because I propose doing a documentary on Jessica probably. 10 years before I finally got permission to do it from the higher ups, okay? Oh, you're higher up, not her, right? Yeah, she yeah. Oh, no, she, she would have been. Yeah. <laughs> but Majeska is someone I never remember meeting. I don't know how she came into my life. She was just someone that was always there. I knew Miss Simpkins. I grew up in the Waverly community here in Columbia. And of course, we would go to the bank or whatever. Uh, my mother was the secretary to the publisher of the Lighthouse and Informer, uh, which was a black newspaper of the time of great significance. And uh, I don't know, but I called Majesca when I worked for WIS TV before going to ETV. I called her one day to do a story on her. And I said, Ms. Simpkins, I'm Beryl Bakers. I'm with WIS TV. And that and she stopped me in the middle. And she said, I know who you are. I know your mom. I know your pop. <laughs> and that's the way Majesca was. And my initial reaction was to be a little intimidated. But Majesca was an amazing character. She was, um, her personality was, uh, hmm. Combated sometimes. She seemed like she was an irascible kind of uh, person, but underneath she had a heart of gold. And she really, for me, was much more of a grandmotherly type figure. Now, this was done in 1990. Majesca was 90 years old. 90 years old. And her recall was amazing at 90. Her spirit was still there at 90. And that to me is what you should attend to because she has gone through, lived through all of these battles where so much progress had been made and arrived at a point where things were beginning to look shaky again. I can't imagine what she would say if she were alive today. I just can't imagine. So with that, that's my introduction. A production of South Carolina ETV. The production of this program is made possible in part by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Southern Educational Communications Association. Damn 
about your fellow man. I always say I nursed my mother's milk. My mother and father were fearless. And we were reared that way. When a skin bone in my body in no time. Now you go to church and they dish out most anything, stand up there and holler and stomp a while and look up there like they see God, and God ain't up there. Nobody knows where he is except as he's in your heart, if you got it. You, if, you, if you get pushed back in a corner, like I have been sometimes, you got to fight your way out. You know what you're going to be back there all that time. I always said I would join working with anybody that's going my way. Now, that means I don't have to go his way, but if he's going my way, I'll work with him. You see, me and the preachers have had a running fight through the years. They, they tell you how to go to heaven when you're catching here on earth, hell here on earth, but they tell you how to get to heaven. So I've had a running fight with them because they are being fed by the people and clothed by the people and got them on piece of cars, a good car riding around there, the people are helping. But sometimes when it comes to them, they say, pray, child, the Lord will take care. Well, I don't, I don't buy that junk. Second Calvary Church was organized in my grandparents' home right up there behind the governor's mansion. But I don't buy that gun, that, that junk to look to God and he'll take care of you. You got to do some of that for yourself. Now, you don't work for honor. So far, I don't. I work because I see a need. I guess I've given way more money to a cause than, you know, I don't know, I've broken myself in causes. But um, you see, there's certain things like an inner satisfaction. It may be a type of selfishness. I don't know. But you do things that give you a satisfaction. And uh, it gives you a happiness and a, set, uh, a sense of uh, peace. Mary Majeska Monteith was born December 5, 1899, at the dawn of the 20th century. Her life chronicles the ebbs and tides of social and political transition in the modern South. It is a life marked by change, challenge, triumph and trying. 1899 was an extraordinary year for black people in the South because uh, over the course of the 1890s there had been some 1600 lynchings. Uh, the Wilmington race riot took place in 1898, uh, New Orleans race riot in 1900. Uh, it was the period of disenfranchisement. But what makes it so striking is that blacks were losing ground that had been gained before. And in the 20th century, we tend to think of the civil rights struggle as being a steady uphill march. Um, if you're living in the 1890s, you remember what's been lost. I was born in, Col in the town of Columbia, in the city. And, uh, my father's mother, who that good-looking old black woman up there on that mantelpiece, she was working in the home of a well-to-do white family here. And uh, the old folks said the daddy of the family ruined her, and so then my daddy was a good-looking brown-skinned man. My daddy never got over, he was, he was a man of strong character, he never got over the fact of his origin. And so he became keen, and, and at that time, all Negro girls had to do, if they made a little extra change, was to work in white homes. And so he decided he didn't want that. And uh, he bought this piece of land and he said, I can remember his words, that I want to raise my children so they know the value of work and the value of a dollar. And so my mother, who had been, who had been a public school teacher before I was born, and reared in one of what they call the high-class Negro homes, a high-class society in Columbia, went out there and became a farm woman. And uh, that's where I came up, learning the value of work and the value of a dollar. Well, she was more like a boy. She was, <laughs> she was more like a leader than anything else. 
which he was brought up to be. We had remarkable parents. They were great leaders, great disciplinarians, and they knew how to condition Majeska to do some of their work. For the Monteith children, each day brought an adventure into town, taking a trolley in order to attend school. Majeska had entered Benedict Institute at age five. She was a student there until 1921 when she graduated and received the A.B. degree. With those Yankees over there, you had to know, you know, you had to learn to appreciate literature. And of course, we had Bible from the first day you went to school. You had Bible. First period in the morning, 45 minutes, everybody in Benedict College had Bible. And you passed in it like you did in trigonometry or anything else. And I, I knew a lot about the Christian Bible. That's what I was taught. But later I became a student of religions, world religions, ancient religions. And then I, I came to realize that... Uh, there's nothing wrong with the, with the philosophy of the Christian religion. There's like there's nothing wrong with but with, uh, with lie, but you ain't supposed to do nothing but wash with it and clean your pots. You ain't supposed to drink it. Following in the footsteps of her mother and her aunts before her, Majeska entered the teaching profession. I was taught ancient history, Benedict, and the first year I was out of school. I couldn't get into the high schools because I wanted to teach mathematics. They had no opening. And... Uh, I taught ancient history at Benedict College in one or two other courses, but particularly my field was ancient history. I mean, my field of interest. But I wanted to teach mathematics. I, I uh, was always interested in things, in exactness, you know. She secured a job teaching at the all-black Booker T. Washington Public School. That lasted until her marriage in 1929 to Andrew Whitfield Simpkins, Jr., an independent businessman, nearly 20 years her senior. I was familiar with her because uh, I was going to Booker Washington at that time. And uh, he would pick her up, take her home. And I would go out to their home out in the country and have meals and things. So I knew it must have been something going on. When she married my father, see, she lost her, two, her job at Booker Washington because they didn't permit you to be married in teaching at Booker Washington at the time. So that's when she went with the Tuberculosis Association and traveled for them. I went to the boss at the commissary store. Folks all starving, please don't close your door. The marriage of Andrew and Majeska Simpkins paralleled another momentous event, the Great Depression, which wrapped the country in a cloak of deprivation and misery. Landlord coming round when the rent is due. You ain't got the money, take your home from you. Take your mule and horse, even take your cow. During the Forget 1930s, the majority of blacks lived in rural areas. High unemployment compounded by poor health conditions, such as deficit diets, high infant mortality, unchecked maternal deaths, and rampant tuberculosis plagued the state. And the instance was high, that is, so many of them died. And of course, there was no uh, medicine for tuberculosis. It was care and proper feeding because a lot of tuberculosis was uh, when the body was malnourished, that is, they weren't strong. That's, and then they um, didn't know certain things of sanitation. If this person had tuberculosis in the family, they didn't know to take his dishes separate and all like that, and so the family would eat. And, all. and then next thing you know, whole families died out. So part of my work was to go in as a special education worker and get meetings together and train these people how to protect themselves from members of their families that had tuberculosis. The state was ill-prepared to deal with the massive number of cases, and black facilities especially were deplorable. 
Ironically, Majeska's aunt, Rebecca Walton, had over a decade previously spearheaded the Masons campaign to build a black sanatorium. Majeska Simpkins uh, really played a key role and a pioneering role in bringing public attention to problems of, of blacks particularly, and also, I think, bringing the attention of black people themselves to the problems that they had and helping to show them how they could minimize those problems. But the fact is, that was my business to go in there and sensitize those people as they a lot of them didn't know about germs. She uh, ran into trouble with the director, Ms. McDonald, about some of her Sunday meetings, the seminars and institutes for teachers and other sorts of health education conferences she had. And Ms. McDonald took the view that that, that was the, the Lord's Day and you shouldn't do work on Sunday, uh, even good work. And Ms. Simpkins, and she urged Ms. Simpkins to have her health education meetings during the week, particularly in the mornings, like the uh, regular Anti-TB Association people did, or the white group did. And Ms. Simpkins just, in effect, read her a quick lesson on race relations in the South, and she asked Ms. McDonald, you know, how do you think those mothers get to your meetings at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning? And Ms. McDonald didn't have any idea. And Ms. Simpkins said it's because there's some black woman in their house taking care of their children. And she said, I have to have meetings when I can reach my audience, and that tends to be weekends and oftentimes on Sunday. So once again, she, she was a very practical-minded person and went out and did her work at a time she could catch the people. A meticulous record keeper, Simpkins put together statistics to publicize the plight of the black poor, showing the interrelationship of poverty and health. She conducted teacher training institutes, involved ministers, physicians, the schools, and anyone who would listen in her public education efforts. But her position became untenable as her burgeoning civil rights activities met with resistance from her supervisor. Somebody told us I was out there, I was supposed to be talking TB, but I was talking about voting and stuff like that, and it got back to her. So eventually, um, after I'd worked with them about 10 years, they um, decided it was was uh, time for me to go, which was all right. When she was saying, uh, she was saying that I, uh, it got to a point where she said she wanted me to go, but she suggested that I resign. I said, I ain't gonna resign nothing. I've done a good job. You don't have nothing against my work. You've never said so. I said, I'm not gonna resign. I said, you just put me out. Her ouster from the TB Association served as a catalyst launching Majeska's complete involvement in the struggle for civil and human rights. At the time I became aware of her presence was the secretary of the South Carolina Conference of Branches of the NAACP. And she worked uh, very closely with the president, James, James M. Hinton, uh, and um, another man who was prominent uh, in the movement, John McRae. And of course, uh, they and others formed a, a, um, a leadership corps who um, adopted the strategies concerning what to do and where to do it and how to do it. The South Carolina Conference of the NAACP had been organized by Levi Byrd in 1939. Hinton and Simpkins were elected in 1941. Following the lead of the national NAACP, the state conference tackled its first major lawsuit, equal pay for black teachers. Osceola McCain, a Sumter native who had returned from self-imposed exile in Belgium, was appalled by the economic conditions he found facing blacks at home. Supported by the Sumter branch, he urged the state conference to institute a lawsuit on behalf of black teachers, whose salaries were vastly inferior to those of their white counterparts. In the school that I taught in, there were 132 black children. The bigger children came in the after the harvest was taken this time of the year, the black, the uh, bigger black kids could come into school, those in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. Uh, the little ones came early, and sometimes we had to have the babies on pallets so that the uh, six-year-olds could come to school. Across the street, the road from where I was, was a white 
house, a house that was whitewashed. There were three white children with a white teacher. That white teacher made $85 a month. And there were two teachers in the school that I taught, and we made $25 a month for a while. And then later on, they gave me as a teaching principal $35. So the two of us made $60, and the white teacher with her um, three children had uh, $85. This was the first of several cases to go before Judge J. Wadey's Waring of the Federal District Court in Charleston. Waring found in favor of the plaintiff, Viola Duvall. And with that victory in hand, the South Carolina Conference, with Harold Bulware as local counsel and Thurgood Marshall heading the national legal staff, began its journey of momentous legal victories for civil rights. The next target for the state conference, dismantling the white primary. In South Carolina, as in all the other southern states, um, blacks were systematically excluded from participating in the Democratic Party and specifically the Democratic Party primary. And uh, since all of the southern states were one-party states, that was effectively exclusion from the political process itself. And um, there were a couple of uh, Supreme Court cases that, that dealt with that point. Uh, one out of Texas where the uh, where the uh, Supreme Court said that the all-white Democratic primary was, was unconstitutional, it was a violation of the uh, 14th Amendment. And um, then there was a companion case that, that followed that in South Carolina. We decided in, the, uh, in, in connection with the local NACP uh, that we were going to make a test case. So then uh, we're still working on the white in 21. So then we instructed people to go to the polls in the effort to register, knowing they very likely would be turned down. In a few instances in, in this, in a few instances in this state, on the urgency from the NACP and maybe one or two other local organizations, Negroes went, and somebody at the poll uh, uh, registration place let them through. Evidently, maybe they had a woman on the books and she's scared you know, in the poll by herself, or maybe somebody knew and he was a good nigger and they let him register, but the thing was, the call had gone out, and it was like the Medes and the Persians they talk about in the Bible, that nobody was to let a black register. So George Elmo went here under our instructions to register here. That's the reason they called it the Elmo case, and they turned him down. And uh, he was willing to become a guinea pig, so to speak. Uh, when, the, when the Texas case was decided, uh, there were attempts uh, by a number of people in South Carolina, blacks, to, uh, to, to participate and vote in the, in the Democratic primary. And the legislature, I think in 1944, met in a special session and repealed all of the laws on the books uh, all of the state laws dealing with the Democratic Party primary. And what they were attempting to do was to take the officiality, if that's the right word, the, the official nature away from the Democratic Party primary and make it a private organization. Uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, facets of the Texas ruling was that since the, the party primaries were governed by state law, this made those primaries official, part of the official electoral procedure, and uh, therefore the states were violating the 14th Amendment. Then when we came back to South Carolina, even though the United States Supreme Court had given us the right, then these old cats down here started making other rules that you couldn't vote, you know, and stopping the polls and all that kind of stuff. Then we had to, we had to continue just wrangling around and messing around down here. But they um, didn't intend uh, to do anything but run the business. Like they said, this is a white man's country. And they had steeped in doubt whether they nursed it with their mother's milk and they intended for it to stay that way. The NAACP was forced to return to court. The second voting rights case, Brown versus Baskins, was won in 1948. It opened the way for blacks to participate in South Carolina politics at all levels. Even after the United States Supreme Court 
the Democratic Party was determined that uh, Negroes wouldn't be full-fledged members of the state party, and and that they wouldn't have a chance to be officials, you know, have official connection, because the um, they first when we first went up to, to the Supreme Court. It was the right to vote, but then we had we couldn't do anything but vote. So then we had a second case, uh, that was the uh, Baskin case, where they gave the right to hold up all privileges in the party, and then the party used subterfuges to prevent full participation. One of the most powerful instruments of change utilized during this period was the Lighthouse and Informer, a black newspaper edited by John H. McRae. McRae had moved from Charleston to Columbia in 1941. His newspaper became the official voice of activism. There, there was nothing that um, escaped us. It be, it, uh, the newspaper became actually the voice of black South Carolina and much of the black South. The primary objective of the lighthouse and farmer was to create settlement in this state uh, to get Negroes fired up to register and vote. And that first all-out effort, the records will show that we registered 150,000 Negroes in this state. Concurrent with their efforts to secure full voting rights, blacks effected another strategy. Spearheaded by John McRae and Osceola McCain, the South Carolina Progressive Democratic Party was formed. They decided the best way they could do, the best attack they could make against the power structure as such in South Carolina was to organize a party and put their own candidates in the field. Composed of blacks and liberal whites, the party then put forth a full slate of candidates, with McCain opposing then-Governor Olin D. Johnston for the U.S. Senate. Because blacks were, were, were denied effective participation in the regular party, they organized uh, uh, their own party, but it, uh, it served as an instrument for activity, but not really as an instrument of electing anybody. State political power structure, as we knew it, was determined that Negroes would not gain any force in the, uh, part in the elections that counted. So that the... Uh, the Progressive Democratic Party was one of the most strategic moves ever made anywhere in the South in that they uh, developed this block of votes, black votes, that many white candidates needed to defeat other white candidates. Though not an official member of the Progressive Democratic Party, Simpkins was one of the major strategists and advisors. Working closely with McRae and McCain, she helped draft resolutions, press releases, and even McCain's campaign statement. So, we had a newspaper. We put on this big registration campaign as soon as we got the, uh, the white primary decision, decision against the white primary. As I told you in that first big push, we raised 150,000 Negroes. Now that's enough to make a politician turn wrong side outwards. When you can control that many votes. And they weren't going to listen to anybody but me and John McCrae and O.C. Old McCain and one or two others. And if somebody tried to get them to do something in, uh, down in Voorhees or up in York, they were going to call me Jessica Simpkins or some one of us on the phone. And many of them, I, I just tell the truth like it is, were not going to do, make a move one way or the other until Ms. Simpkins said that's the thing to do. The case for equal educational opportunity began with a bus transportation suit. Now sometimes you go in and create the atmosphere for a case and work out the clients according to what, where you want the case to go. But that rise came out of the people themselves because their children were walking in the rain and storms and snow and sleet as white children rode. It wasn't they hated the whites, it just they had as much right of paying taxes like white people. So they just said, we ought to have riding too, which was, was right. And the Clarendon case arose out of Clarendon and they needed state office and national office 
assistance. At that time, the intent was separate but equal. When we first went to court, uh, that was when Judge Waring said, why I told uh, 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 Justice Marshall, why do you come in here talking about separate but equal? If you want to do anything, attack the whole system. Thus encouraged, the South Carolina State Conference agreed to prepare a test case. Twenty plaintiffs would be required for such a major effort. The Reverend J.A. Delane and others undertook the challenge of securing petitioners. What you had, who you had bringing the suit, you had, you had some small farmers. Most of them were poor. Uh, you had small farmers. You had a lot of. You had a number of sharecroppers who insisted that their names go on that petition, whether they got run off the farm or not. Absolutely. It would be virtually impossible for me to tell you just what some of these people encountered. Most of them were farmers. When we began the Clarendon County movement, they knew that there would be pressures, and the only thing that we had for blacks to do at that time uh, was to either teach or preach. The teachers were afraid to be seen associating with us. So it became necessary to get salt of the earth people, people who were not highly educated, but who had a groping desire to see that their children uh, got a better way of life than they got. Several of the people who were uh, involved lost their jobs, had to move away because no one else would employ them. We saw a period of intimidation where they organized the white citizen councils they heard of this organization that had been organized in Mississippi uh, to combat the uh, blacks who wanted to get a better way of life. And oddly enough, our superintendent of education, the late Reverend L.B. McCord, heard of this movement and went to Mississippi and got all the facts and brought it back and organized the white citizen councils. Now, every known member of NAACP uh, was placed on a list. If you were a farmer, you could not buy fertilizer for your farms if you were a known member of NAACP. Cotton gins refused to gin cotton for our members. Uh, timber dealers refused to buy timber products from our members. Some of our members taking tobacco to the market when it was discovered who they were other people were getting 39 cents a pound for tobacco, and their tobacco sold for 14 and 15 cents, uh, trying to force them out of business. Banks would not loan money. It was a period there that few people can really understand what these gallant men went through to get our God-given rights as American citizens. And of course, their attitude was that whatever it takes to do it, that's what we'll do. And, of course, people would have made untold sacrifices. If those few that had credit, the credit was cut. Uh, jobs were lost. Some people who were sharecropping had to move, you know. But uh, they banded together, and they, they survived. We'll stand the storm. It won't be long. We'll by and by we'll stand the storm it won't be long we'll anchor by and the white by. citizen councils were organized the Ku Klux Klan was revived they started shooting into our homes my funeral home here was shot into six different times they began burning crosses Thurgood Marshall was getting factual reports in New York about conditions, and they were telling him how conditions were deteriorating, and that if he continued to press for the Clarendon County case, there would be mass bloodshed here in the county, that they thought that the time had come when they had to broaden the scope of the suit. Briggs versus Elliott, you know, was one of the five cases that went to the United States Supreme Court and resulted in the decision of uh, May 1954 
in a group of cases, the first of which was uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Majeska Simpkins also rose to the occasion coordinating relief efforts on behalf of area citizens who faced severe economic reprisals. I had worked over the state first as a director of Negro work under the, under the State TV Association. And I had a lot of ties already that I could go in there and tie directly into. But we used, I remember the long, long rides we used to take through the state when she was making her speeches at various churches and whatnot. As I was, became older and was able to drive myself, uh, I would go with her to drive her to certain places in the country, such as Clarendon, Sumter, Williamsburg County. And it was hard for me to believe how Majeska could remember or know how to get to little churches that were so far back off the main road. And, you know, she would go to any meeting anywhere at any time. And this was the only way that we really could get to the people. And she was an excellent speaker. I do remember very vivid, vividly my, gra my grandmother and my mother always being concerned when Majeska was out of town, especially in the low country, Clarendon and Sumter counties, about her safety. They were always afraid that something might happen to her or, and that she might not come home, she'd be injured or killed. Many times I know personally when Levi Pearson didn't have money to buy uh, food on Saturday, Majeska Simpkins would go into her pocket and not loan but give uh, these people money for the necessities of life. And I've seen some of them go to the bank. They didn't qualify for bank loans, but she made personal loans to them and told them, if you never pay it back, this is all well with me and with God. Always in a struggle, in a battle, our movement, there are people in the spare head. So few of us are in the spare head. Out in the front line, just keeping pushing this thing. If you don't, a movement will die. This is a part of the group of lawyers from all sections of the country who are here in the Supreme Court for the purpose of arguing the school segregation cases. As you know, these cases were set for re-argument on last June, and we believe that the proper place for the issue of segregation and anything connected with it is in a court and not in the political arena where you have the probable jurisdiction of differences of opinion not connected with the law. Finally, victory was at hand. The decision itself uh, referred to um, racially separate schools and declared that in the field of education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. But in effect, it, uh, the reach of the case was into the entire uh, fabric of, uh, of state-supported activities. Trouble will be over, amen. Trouble will be over. Trouble will be over when I see Jesus. Trouble will be over. Amen. As black Carolinians sought to actualize their court granted rights, die hard segregationists closed ranks. Blacks, tired of being victimized by an economic backlash and a segregated system, retaliated with systematic boycotts of their own. They wouldn't sell certain things to blacks and uh, certain privileges of jobs were taken away. So then, somewhere, I don't remember now where we got it from, but the term of economic freeze came up. The economic freeze was cutting, you know, cutting somebody's income. So then, 
we froze on the stores. There's a rough road I'm traveling, trying to get home. I got a serious road I'm traveling, trying to get home. I got to cross that old city curtain, bad mind, heavy burden. It's a rough, rocky road to travel, trying to get home. It was a turbulent period throughout the Deep South, and in South Carolina, fully a decade would pass before the tide began to turn. All through the fight through slavery and uh, the civil rights struggle coming up until now, there were whites that didn't believe in what the power structure was doing. You would always hear me use the expression power structure, because not all of the whites were, were in that realm of thought. During the height of her involvement with the state NAACP conference, Majeska was simultaneously involved with a number of reform movements on the regional and national levels. She was one of only five black women to participate in the historic Durham conference. She was also a member of its offspring. The Southern Regional Council became the first major biracial group in the South. Well, Majeska had been an important person in the South Carolina branch of the Commission on Interracial Cooperation, probably the most militant and outspoken member of that commission. And uh, I assume that, that, that that's why she was invited. But in any case, the, uh, out of that Durham meeting came a, uh, a, a remarkable document for the time. The Southern Negro Youth Congress met in an interracial body in Columbia, South Carolina in 1946. Here, Paul Robeson sang, and W.E.B. Du Bois gave his famed Behold the Land address. Majeska Simpkins was the convention organizer, and that post-war youth legislature attracted a thousand delegates, black and white, foreign and American. You call that a brother? No, no. She was a charter member of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, which was organized in 1938 and inspired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. The Southern Conference for Human Welfare was organized, I mean, it had its headquarters in Birmingham, and it was organized to improve conditions, uh, not just for blacks, but the disadvantaged whites in the South. Recently, the Southern Organizing Committee for Economic and Social Justice and participants in those early efforts met again in Birmingham. The occasion, the acknowledgement of the 51st anniversary of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. She's not an old lady. She's just been here a long time. And, and she's still pretty. Give her a hand. At home on any stage, she regaled the audience with stories of the first Southern Conference for Human Welfare meeting, when the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, defied the laws of segregation. She said, bring me a piece of chalk. Any of you all in here old enough to remember Ms. Roosevelt, remember how she did? Bring me a piece of chalk. And they brought the chalk. She said, now bring me a ruler. And she said, now measure from this side to that side. Now mark one, the midline on that line that you have. And put an X, which they did. And my friend said, when, Mrs. Ro when they did that, Mrs. Roosevelt said, now bring me a chair. <laughs> and she said, set it directly over that mark. Now that meant that the middle of that seat of that chair was over that X. And Mrs. Roosevelt sat there, as I used to like to say, with one of her hips on one side of that mark <laughs> and one of her hips on the other side of that mark. Eleanor Roosevelt did that in Birmingham. I, I would think of her as being a great listener, listening at all sides, being as objective as she could about things, but when it came down to speaking her mind, she would do that 
Well, she never would hesitate to tell what she thought was the truth. Uh, and uh, she was a very remarkable woman because uh, her lack of fear uh, was so great that she, uh, you know, she did it to the legislators and she did it to congressmen, to senators, and she sent it to the board of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. Well, I would classify her as a person of directness to the point. I think Modesca comes to the point, speaks to the issue, and in the situation in which she's involved, and I've always admired her for that. I can remember this and not only show her bravery, but also her uh, talent for uh, making people mad, you know, and bringing up an issue. I was invited to the University of South Carolina and uh, to make a speech, and she was invited to introduce me. And so she introduced me by telling me about the uh, terrible plight of the poor black men in South Carolina. And she gave an extremely graphic statement. Sir, maybe you've seen that well, I was saying that with my face red style. and really blushing and also uh, <laughs> wondering if we're going to get thrown out. And the young people uh, were quite upset, I think, by what she said. So she finally sat down. And then I had to, <laughs> you know, tell about the long struggle for the vote. And <laughs> but nobody paid much attention to me after my Jessica's terrific speech. As you, as you well know, in the late 40s and early 50s, there was a real sickness in the country of um, um, very hysterical anti-communism, which uh, had very little to do with communism, really, because most of the people who were caught up in it didn't know communism from rheumatism. It was the it was a buzzword. It was a scare word that anything was communist if it wasn't, uh, if it was advocating any kind of change. All the organizations at that time were attacked simply because it was an effort, a national effort, to quiet uh, dissension against the government. Not that they were fighting the government, they were fighting some of the things the government allowed to happen. Just like we're having a sec in our federal government now. We've had eight years of do-nothing under Reagan. That cat sat up there and acted fool, a fool in the ears. I ring his fool, but he sat up there for eight years. The country's retrogressed. So there's just a case of uh, movements come up when certain pressures come down. People who, sometimes people in the civil rights movement, black and white, who were not afraid of police dogs or going to jail or anything else, but we're afraid of being called a traitor to your country. That's a scary thing. And I say, you know, there are different kinds of courage. There's physical courage, there's moral courage. I don't think I got much physical courage. Those things always scared me. There were some people who had both. Majeska was one of them. I mean, I don't think Majeska was ever scared of man or beast. I belonged to and was connected with, corresponded with, met in meetings with people that were said to be communists, and you know, the House Un-American Activities Committee. My name is sitting up on it. And I guess on that list are a hundred organizations. Why? Because they didn't follow like sheep in the path of people that were in power in government at that time. The personality of Majeska is the one that uh, sort of uh, encourages you and propels you to make a challenge. Uh, Majeska seems kind of synonymous with struggle. By 1957, the NAACP was being pressured to purge its ranks of effective leadership. Red baiting was an especially useful tactic, and Majeska Simpkins, through her many involvements in various reform movements, was deemed particularly vulnerable. That year, when the nominating committee of the state conference offered its slate of candidates, Majeska's name was conspicuously absent. At the following conference meeting, James Hinton did not offer for re-election as president. Thus, a new era of leadership emerged. In other words, our watchword, our motto, our aim is freedom now, not piecemeal. Freedom. Simpkins then turned her energies to parallel reform projects, many on the local level. But all freedom now 
uh, equal to that of any other American citizen. While the NAACP continued to press the case for school desegregation across the state, the Richland Citizens Council hammered away on the Columbia schools. We uh, work very closely with the integration of the schools here in Richland School District 1. The first 22 students, in uh, 22 black students, uh, that integrated the school system here, uh, Richland County Citizens Committee spearheaded this. Bless the children, keep in mind what they see in their faces. Public Relations Director, uh, she was getting the information out, you know, we'd have meetings, sitting down, talking with parents, and uh, discussing what was taking place, and she was the Public Relations Director of the Richmond County Citizen Committee. She was laying the plans out, and we were following them. Those plans were very good plans, because uh, school was integrated. In 1963, Majeska Simpkins was indirectly involved in a suit to integrate the University of South Carolina. My sister Rebecca, she was a kind of, she made up her mind that she was going to be instrumental in opening that school. And of course, we worked as a family unit. My, now, my brothers never were. The women in our, my mother's children were the Hellcats, not my brothers. And so, when Rebecca decided she wanted to do it, we planned a lot of the strategy right here in this house. A lot of that strategy is right, right, a lot of the strategy for the whole civil rights movement in recent years planned right in this house. And so she decided, and she finally said, if it's the last thing I do, I'm gonna open that university. Charges of communist affiliation surfaced once again in 1966, when Simpkins was invited to appear on a program on behalf of avowed communist Herbert Apfecker. This time, the detractors were leaders of the state Democratic Party. Well, now, so far as actually knowing who was a communist, I don't actually know one except that I know that Apfecker through the years has been professed and has publicized himself as a communist and still does. Now, other than that, I would have to glean, but I was in an organization was fighting for the objective I was interested in. It didn't matter to me whether he was a communist or an SOB. I, I hate to say I have no recollection of that incident now, you know, being that far back. Uh, I do recall, you know, during that period of time that there was a general feeling there was, was communism involved in the movement, and I think we all got caught up in that and that we were conscious of it and we probably took advantage of the opportunity to say, you know, this is a communist in inspired movement or this issue or something like that. I have in my possession a report from the House and American Activities Committee alleging that she was a member of participating in over 30 communist fronts throughout the United States. I think it is high time that the public officials let the, our citizens throughout this state know a little bit of the background of this particular individual. They weren't concerned about, they knew I wasn't any communist. They knew that, because I didn't give a damn what they thought or knew. But on the other hand, what they wanted to do was to shut your mouth, bride you, as they used to say. A former stringer for the Associated Negro Press, Simpkins is prolific in her writings and still today sends out news releases and editorials as she sees the need. Normally your encounters with her was through the newspapers. Uh, she, was, she, she spoke to you generally through, through the media or by writing letters. I uh, don't doubt the governor's sincerity and I don't doubt his veracity. I just say the, government is, the governor is speaking out of a wealth of misinformation and ignorance on the subject. Instance, I've always been a creature of confrontation. Of this, in this she don't need a mealy mouthing and messing around. If something's got to be done, it's got to be done. If this person can't do it, maybe somebody else can do it. And I've never, I, I guess it comes in that I have never had certain connections with the power structure that I felt I had to kind of pet. And I think, to be honest, uh, she, the, the, the term has been been used, sort of an agitator, 
and agitate her, uh, not in the wrong way, but she really agitated even the black leadership to be more aggressive. Uh, she probably was as critical of the NAACP for not being more aggressive as she was for us for not being more responsive to her and, and to the movement. She's able to see beyond the individual to the greater cause, to the greater good, and she feels that, um, that for a person to be successful, that one should not be held down by narrowness. And she is, she is the opposite of that. She is not narrow in her thinking. I think a lot of people like myself and who, who were particularly white folks in the 60s got involved in the movement because we, we knew that segregation was wrong. Racism was an evil. And hypocrisy of the institutions that we had been involved in was just uh, absolutely shameful and stupid. And it hurt us. But we didn't realize that that was something, that the battles to change that had been going on for generations. So it wasn't until after we had gotten very much involved that then we started to realize that, my gosh, you know, somebody was saying these same things, standing in these same places, getting arrested. And it, those were the people like Majeska Simpkins. She taught me politics. She taught me a newspaper business. And she taught me about people. The fact is, the one thing I learned from her is to never give up and never be to defeated and never quit. Ms. Simpkins was the first black person I know of that was vocally involved in the environmental movement. Uh, she had spoke at um, the first rallies that we did in the, in the 70s around the Savannah River plant and articulated very clearly about how it's, uh, radiation doesn't just seek out rich white Republicans and that um, and all too often the people that find themselves living around environmental hazards are poor black people. During most of the 1970s, I was in prison. I was a member of the Wilmington 10. We were sentenced to a combined total, 10 of us, of 282 years in prison in North Carolina for our involvement in the Civil Rights Movement. And the uh, Southern Organizing Committee uh, played a very invaluable leadership role, uh, Majeska, Ann Brayton, and others. Um, fought the courts back. It's very difficult to reverse a conviction in this country. We were innocent, but in North Carolina they say, okay, well, prove your innocence. You're guilty till you prove your innocence. And it took us almost a decade. We did not win our case until December 4th, 1980. I spent five years in uh, almost maximum security prisons in North Carolina, five different prisons. But in no time did I feel alone because I knew that Majeska Simpkins was out there organizing. And Majeska visited me once while I was in prison. And uh, I felt very moved, even though we were talking through uh, iron bars, the solidarity was there. Well, Ms. Simpkins is a, peace, a people person. There are thousands of people that's personally indebted to her around this city, around this state, and around this nation. Uh, she can't say no to anybody. If you have a problem, she will do whatever it takes to work it out. On three separate occasions she has offered for public office, each time she's been defeated. I'm not sure that uh, the city council was ready for Majeska Simpkins, <laughs> but uh, she was serious and I think she would have done an excellent job. But no, I never wanted to hold office because you could raise a gang more hell out here freelancing than you could sitting up there with somebody coming to you about this. No, I never really wanted to hold office, but I um, did it more like uh, you know, being like a net or something, a flea or something, just worrying the politician. She's just an extraordinary person. <laughs> That's all. all I can say. Do I agree with everything she's done? Just about. I think that she has, has elevated uh, political problems or differences to moral positions. I mean, they're not, in, they're not racial, um, and in, in most respects, they're not even political. There's just right and there's wrong, and you feel it. You know, she's, she's, she feels her politics. I think, <clears throat> well, Jessica, had she been a man, she would be right up there with Martin Luther King. Uh, she was 
the conscience of South Carolina. And it, it's just wonderful, you know, wonderful that she would be there and, and let me know that I can be 90 years old. I can do this until I'm 90. I can stand up and, <laughs> and say, say, this has got to change. This is absolutely dumb. You know, and that's what she does. It's great. Throughout the visible struggles of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Majeska Simpkins continued to lend her name, her energies, and her intellect to the causes of justice. Now, 90 years old, Majeska is still maintaining an avid interest in world affairs. A frequent guest on television and radio programs, Simpkins is highly sought after on the lecture circuit. Political candidates still seek her endorsement. Troubled citizens still seek her aid. Advisor, confidant, activist, and advocate, for this respected stateswoman, the struggle for human rights continues. I am Majeska Monteith Simpkins, and I am still trying to help make a way out of no way for my people. more than she has, I think. And every time I do, I see things I didn't see before. It just unfolds like a many petal blossom. Thank you. you have me. seen it more than I. I told you the other day, the last time I saw it was at uh, the Unitarian Church oh, when you showed it. And that was... You better talk to that microphone right there. Okay. Right here on the ceiling I so the people in Charleston can hear you. Hi, people in Charleston <laughs> and elsewhere. I'm really gratified that you showed it, and I, you know, it reminded me of a lot of things that I've forgotten in those years, and uh, I'm also gratified to know that we were able to capture so many giants of the movement, because with the exception of you, Brett, and maybe Jackie Hall, and her husband, Bob, and, and Bob, and uh, Ben Chavis, who is now the executive director of the NAACP, all of those other stalwarts have gone on. They are no longer here. And uh, as you look at it, I hope that you also get a feeling for South Carolina's importance mm -hmm. in the national human and civil rights struggle. We don't take credit for it, mostly I think because it's been suppressed, but South Carolina was really paramount in many of the major decisions that impact our lives. If we start with say, Briggs versus Elliott, everybody knows about Brown versus Board of Education, but few people understand that the major arguments in that group of cases presented to the Supreme Court were derived from the experiences of the people in Clarendon County. Briggs v. Elliott should have been the lead case in Brown versus Board of Education. Nobody talks about Edwards versus South Carolina. That's the case uh, of students in, what was it, 1961? Uh, protesting at the State House, and uh, one of them was uh, James Edwards. 
Well, that case was found in Edwards's favor and is the definitive case which allows the right of peaceful assembly for protesters across the country. And nobody said that's a South Carolina case. No, it, it's, it's just amazing to me how little we know about our own history and how little we know about the roles we and these people in our midst have played. If you recall the photo of uh, the lawyers, Thurgood Marshall and others standing on the steps of the Supreme Court, right behind Marshall was Harold Bulwer. Harold Bulwer was a local Columbia lawyer, but he was so instrumental in all of those early NAACP challenges, and nobody knows his name. It, it's, it's sort of frustrating to me uh, that we don't honor these legendary heroes and heroes who really affected change. And the other thing I hope that the, I, as I look at it, I, know I have to cringe because technology is different and I'm looking at things thinking, oh, I wish we hadn't done this that way or the other, or I wish the levels were different. But I hope that the one thing, one of the things you got out of watching this particular production is the fact, the breadth of Majeska's involvement in so many organizations and causes, not just locally or regionally, but nationally. That list of organizations over her face at the end was a partial list of things that we could find that she had actually been involved in one way or the other. And the correspondences that she had with people like Herbert Apfecker but also with Howard Thurman. I don't know if you are aware of who Howard Thurman is. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let Brett pull it up or if I'll pull it up for another course. But uh, Howard Thurman was an amazing minister with whom Majeska maintained an active correspondence all her life. Um, the other thing is she wasn't just some dumb little lady out there. She was a true student her entire life. I mean, when she tells you she was a student of ancient history, or she's a student of religion, or she's a student of sociology, she was. She also was a lover of poetry and fine literature. And her one unfulfilled dream was to have one day visited Europe. Mm -hmm. But she never got to do that. But she did try to impact others' lives. There are many things that uh, were on the cutting room floor, as it were, things that she was involved in. Uh, when we look at uh, the Orangeburg Massacre, for example, and other things of that ilk, uh, it's just, you can only put so much in an hour. And some things just had to go by the wayside. Um, I'm trying to think if there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, the bottom line is Majeska didn't have to do any of this. Her husband was an independent businessman and he owned several businesses. I mean, he had liquor stores, he had service stations. They had a hotel or motel out on the edges of the city, which was profitable because of course, Blacks, entertainers, and others who came couldn't stay in the white hotels, so they could stay in the Simbeck Hotel. Uh, people like, uh, of course, you know that Thurgood Marshall and others would come to Columbia, and they would stay back there in the dependency if they didn't stay in the house itself with Majeska. But she was serious when she talked about the fact that much of the strategies of these movements was planned around her dining room table. And she was very vocal and very involved. Sometimes a whole lot more than the men who get credit for having been out there on the front lines. But my point is, Majeska could have settled back and been a society day. You know, Black society, despite the fact that there was oppression, you know, we've always had parallel 
movement where there are for there are people who are of higher means who can afford to be above the fray. And Majeska could have been one of those. There was no reason for her to be out there fighting like this, but she did it. We don't hear about her fights over at uh, the Department of Mental Health. She's a staunch mental health advocate, particularly for Blacks who were confined in a horrible, horrible condition, but for everybody. She's a staunch advocate for imprisoned men, primarily men. Um, just cases that you don't think of. And of course, you know the environmental movement, the anti-apartheid, and she just was an amazing woman whose legacy I really wish we could preserve um, as much as possible. And I think it's a responsibility that we make sure that those who come be behind us and those who are our peers learn more about this amazing icon. Now, do you have any questions for me? Because I want to say I'm, I'm amazed. I told Brett when I walked in, I'm amazed that you're here <laughs> because I know you know the USC women's basketball team is playing and that's a powerful lure. So to come and watch a 34-year-old movie, that's that says something. So thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm interested in, in, in the earliest part where she was working with TV and knowing that uh, TV was a weapon used by the eugenics movement against uh, people of African origin. Um, and I know that Matilda Evans actually created a journal toward the education and, and, and public health. Did she have, did, did uh, the Simpkins have any relationship with Dr. Evans? I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did. I, I don't know that per se, I didn't study it or read it, but just because of their lifespan and their interests, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure she did. Yeah. What was the where was Dr. Um, Dr. Evans? Matilda Evans, Evans, she's a Columbia physician. She's one of the first she female. She created two hospitals here herself. Well, one would be Waverly, I guess, right? She did not create Waverly. No. Hers was what? The, the Taylor yeah. Lane. Lane Taylor and and um she had uh what's the, the it was named after one of the streets uh right off the of Taylor Street. But uh, she created two hospitals. Actually, some, some people would argue it was three, uh, but it might have been just a clinic. She also had a nursing uh, school uh, where when she had graduation, uh, there were people lined up to hire her graduates right out of uh, graduation. And because of the conditions in uh, in school in, in, in Columbia, she bought a piece of property which was located near uh, uh, Tunash Road and Beltline in that general area uh, and used it as a park for uh, Black youth to and be. She able created to, a park because it didn't have a public right. park. And she actually built a swimming pool there. And according to an article in the Charlotte Observer, she actually taught herself to swim so she could be the lifeguard. Really? Yeah. Matilda Evans is, a, is another amazing character that you should I add to your. Yeah. I don't have to own her in my book. I, 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 I want to say one thing about her. Uh, my father said when he was a, a young man in college, you could often see her tooling around on her bicycle. She'd go visit, she'd make her house visits okay. on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, one mm -hmm. of the things that we, we try and do here, Vera, we're, this is the 10th year, and this is only the, this is the fifth class coming out? Yes. So we're only five into like 16 classes. And so you, you're you earning a free scholarship to the Modesto School because we're the place that you come to learn where woke gets effective. 
Thank you. But I want to say that, that my job is to connect this past that we forget and don't there for reasons we forget, but we were never told. But we lift up at the point where we're talking about Majesco, which is class eight or nine or ten, that she was got unhired by the tuberculosis society because of the business of wanting to have her meetings on Sunday. But what she was doing was contrary to what they wanted because she was trying to find the root cause of the disease, which was poverty. She said, I can't tell these people to do things. They don't have money. So she's doing basic community organizing mm -hmm. to get people out of the circumstance that's causing the symptom of tuberculosis. And so it's that analysis of what causes the problem that separates a radical from a combinationist that would just give them a bar of soap and hope they could find water. And by the way, that's Matilda Evans on the screen right now. Oh, thank you, Dr. Jones. I think there's a street named after her now in the Bull Street District. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but there's nothing named after Miss Simpkins in Columbia. Did right? not there's historic not Columbia or... with the City of Women have? I'm sure Majestic's right, name was on the list. Is there like a monument at the State House grounds? No. <laughs> no, he said yeah. a street. Or, or, or just, just a street. Yeah. Well, this street here, we've, we've facilitated a class of youngsters that was being organized by the Department of Education to be able to do a model of teaching second graders, I think it was, Robert, you may remember, uh, about racism. Yeah. And they, they got into, they wrote uh, a, class, a, a booklet. The, the young people, the second graders, wrote a little booklet about the Jessica. And do you remember the rabbi's name that was teaching the school? It's a, a PhD um, at the at Department of Education. These were his um, graduate student teachers that had this class. And um, I suggested they wanted to do something. What can they do? I suggested they name the street the Majeska Way. Oh, and there's a sign up there now that says yeah. the Majeska Way. So uh, it, trust me, it was not from the status quo that lifted up Majeska's uh, history. <laughs> Says follow up to that. Um, she didn't speak about her legacy in, in the in the film. Uh, some people that have pumped that much probably would have or lived themselves. Up. I mean, she she wasn't. In, in, she she talks about what she, what she had done, but in terms of like continuing legacy, did she think about that? Talk about that. The she, was. Modest, I guess, would be the word that would come. I mean, she was not concerned with yeah. legacy in terms of people elevating her or knowing about her. She was concerned with knowing that her efforts had not been in vain and that we would continue to keep fighting. That, that's the kind of legacy I think she, she talked about. Thank you. Dr. Green, you have questions on well, the chat? There is not, not any questions in the chat, but I see Melissa Reyes has her hand raised. So, uh, Melissa, go ahead with your question. Yeah, I wanted to know if there were any labor struggles that possibly didn't make the cut. Uh, we have pictures of her walking picket lines. And uh, one of the more interesting elements of the Southern Negro Youth Congress was at the time the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, was integrated and they had a program called um, Dixie. Operation Dixie. Operation Dixie. And at that conference, we'll talk about when we get to the 1940s in the Majesca School at the Township Auditorium, there were 170 white delegates. Most of them were related to unions and many of them were probably communists because those were the only people that believed in equality at the time. So yeah, Melissa, we'll get to that. Thanks for the question. And Cora Webb, your hand is also raised. Go ahead and ask the question, please. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you uh, for presenting the film and then having a the filmmaker here. Um, I uh, was raised in the Richland County public school system from elementary to high school. And when I watch things like this, it just kind of makes me almost like I'm like very hopeful, but also like shameful because a lot of like people in my community, of course, value education, but I always feel like I got the wrong education because these things were not talked about, which is why I wanted to do this course, of course. 
Um, and so my question is like, what aspects of your community work led you to be interested in documentarian work? Because I, my family is also really into like storytelling. Like my father so was raised in Columbia, South Carolina um, and in the South as well. Um, and I've inherited a great interest of doing like memory work and um, like recording people's stories. I don't know what path this may lead me on, like some maybe one day do some type of documentary, but I would like to hear more about like the logistics of you actually doing it. Like what things came up for you in your path as like uh, someone documenting the life of somebody else. Well, I mentioned that I'm a product of the Waverly community in Columbia. Having grown up here, I attended W.A. Perry Junior High School and C.A. Johnson. I'm a proud graduate of C.A. Johnson High School. Um, and when I was in high school, it was during the period of school integration. So I'm very cognizant of how the Black school suffered as a result of integration. Um, it, I know, for example, that my education coming out of poor old C.A. Johnson High School is far superior to that of my children who attended Lexington Five Schools, for example. Um, also, I mentioned my parents were already involved in various things. So I was reared with a sense of social consciousness. And going away to college, I <laughs> was the first time I really became aware of the fact that, for example, we were considered impoverished. We didn't have this, that, and the other. And I could look back at the wealth of opportunities and advantages of that segregated neighborhood that had two colleges and a hospital and a street lined with doctors who live there and teachers and carpenters and every other aspect of any community and who functioned as a total insulated world. Now, I'm telling you that because I happened into broadcasting by accident, not by plane. I thought I was gonna be in somebody's lab doing something. I started out as a zoology major, okay? But I was in uh, the Boston area in Cambridge one summer while I was in grad school, and I needed a summer job. And I don't know if you know anything about the Boston area, but there are at least 50 schools there. So I wasn't coming up with a job. And I shared this with my mom, and she said, well, I think so-and-so over at the Urban well, League I, was just talking about, you know, they've got some I'm, opportunities I'm here. Until, until tomorrow. Uh, to go why don't you talk to them? And I did. And they told me yeah. that there was a local radio station that was looking for somebody who could run a radio board. I could do that because that was one of my volunteer activities when I was an undergrad. And so I said, cool. I sent my little resume. Okay. And I get this call from what was then WIS Radio, which was the major radio station back in those days. I don't know if you remember that, Brett, but WIS Radio and TV were, were connected. You were in Boston? Then. I was in Cambridge, yeah. They had WIS Radio? No, 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 here. I know here, but okay. Yeah. So I, I, I sent my resume in, and I got hired for this summer job. And I came here, and as often happens to Blacks, especially during that period, when they were attempting to integrate various agencies and, and professions. Um, when I got ready to go back to school, the Urban League asked me to postpone it, to stay, because of course you need to help the community and you're making inroads here, that kind of thing. And I, um, it was also during that unfortunate period when there was a woman who hosted or co-hosted the morning show on WIS TV uh, who unfortunately committed suicide. And they transferred me from radio to television while they went through this period of assessing what they were going to do and whom they were going to hire. Well, 
<clears throat> I'm in television now and I'm doing stories and I get the opportunity to dabble in long form story because I realized that there was an aspect of our news that was not sensitive to the community around me that did not know. And I was fortunate. I mean, I knew these people. I De Quincey Newman was the assistant pastor at my church. Matthew Perry lived around the corner. I mean, he was older, but he had grown up around the corner from me. Reverend James Hinton lived three doors down from me on my childhood street. So I knew these people and I knew that the reality of uh, what I understood to be going on in our communities is not necessarily what was being captured in film. And so the first film that I got to, documentary that I got to do, I did while at WIS television. And it was the year that Judge Matthew Perry was named uh, the South Carolinian of the Year. And after that, I got to do one on Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. And somewhere along the way, ETV asked me to come over there and assured me that I could do more long form programming if I were there. Something I could not do doing those three <laughs> segments or minute and a half pieces for the seven o'clock news. And so that's how I got into documentary filmmaking. And uh, I seem to have gotten stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. So I'm still there doing that. I'm technically retired, but I still sort of freelance and work with that. Because that's my medium. I want to tell those stories that haven't been told. And there's so many. So please, if you're interested or you know somebody else, there's so many stories that need to be told. Let me suggest to Cora that part of the Majesca School is a, uh, a practicum. How are you going to practice what it is that we're preaching? And so I think, Cora, you could probably do some simple oral interviews to get started for our archives. And I suggest you make an appointment with Pearl Dakers. I will do that. I will definitely do that. Yeah, I, there's so much overlap. Like my grandmother was a secretary at Benedict College and my grandfather was a teacher at uh, Perry. And Who so- father? You say that again? Who was your grandfather? Uh, John Webb. Okay. I remember and my, yeah. and my grandmother was Carlotta Webb. And so that's- I, Carlotta, okay. <laughs> yeah, you gonna know that. <laughs> Yeah, the way our family saw, so yeah, um, yeah, for my namesake, my, that's why my name is Cora, because I was my great grandma's name, and she also <laughs> was around in part, so yeah. I'd be happy to help, and certainly we have allied organizations like the Civil Rights Center at the university, where you could also hone your skills and do things of that sort, so let's talk. Communications director. Yes, Becky, go ahead. Your hands up like about five minutes now. <laughs> go ahead, Becky. Um, first, I just want to thank you so much. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Um, I know I'm not alone in being a big fan of yours for years and um, from Nature Scene, and we really miss Rudy, and um, I know y'all are still mourning him. So um, our thoughts are with you there. But I really just wanted to thank you for this documentary, which has been um, so enriching to our classes for 10 years. We've shown it every year and every year, everybody gets so much out of it, including Brett and me who think that we know her well, but we really, you know, this kind of stuff is so invaluable. And so we thank you for that. And I'm just, you said that you had pitched it 10 years earlier, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And that, that you didn't get the green light um, I would like to know what was their hesitation and what was left on the cutting room floor, not for lack of space, but for content, if anything. Now, Becky, you're challenging my memory from 34 years ago, right? <laughs> you can call me. We can talk later if you want. <laughs> we probably would need to do that. Let me just say that it was hard to do a lot of things. Um, I pitched the Richard Roberts documentary 
15 years before they approved that. And when they finally did, I didn't even get to do it. So that was not an uncommon thing. You had to really fight to do things like that just because it was a matter of, well, we don't have the time or the resources or the, you know. Point of information here that we'll get to when we get to the 2008 digitization of broadband mm. is that SCETV is the only publicly owned um, broadcasting system, public public EDS, education broadcasting system in the nation. The state legislature controls and owns all 63 licenses and the people, that's us, paid for the entire system. But it is limited to the attitude of the most aggressive legislator that sits on ETB's budget and appoints their commissioners who then hire people that work for them. And so we'll talk about that when Ms. Baker is not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say, though, that we, we do have some people in our administration now who are very progressive, who it's want true. to do more. But they are hamstrung by those very factors that you bring up. So it, it's it's a matter of wow. If Miss Simpkins was trouble, that's the that was an editorial in the state newspaper, probably not long before they started turning you down to make the thing. Well, I don't think they would appreciate my bringing this to your attention, but you have to understand that South Carolina Educational Television um, was one of the leading public television com companies in the country, but it was created by our legislature. It was sanctioned in order to avoid integration. Now, they pitched the story that if we provide broadcast instruction, instructional television, then we circumvent this whole issue of white children and black children having to sit side by side. So something that was created for, I won't say evil, but was created <laughs> not with the best intentions yeah. has fortunately developed into something that uh, can be of great use to our yeah. citizens. All of us. You have done a marvelous job in terms of the original production work. Beryl and, and Bessie Newman has worked through, and their professionalism has brought us uh, some of the best documentaries in South Carolina history, including the Rollins, Rollins sister movie, which we will be linking to. We've already linked to, and we talked about that. Good. So thank you for hanging out, hanging in, and hanging on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes. If there's time, I don't know if anyone else wants to ask a question. I've asked, asked one already. No, go ahead, you please. Just, you mentioned um, that uh, Ms. Simpson, um, Mrs. Simpson was a um, mental health advocate. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you could uh, share a little bit about her, her work with that. At, well, equity in terms of health care. I think mostly what she did was expose the deplorable conditions under which uh, the inmates inmates, yeah. patients yeah. Uh, lived in our mental health facilities. Those patients out at Crass Farrow, which was the Black Mental Health Hospital, as well as patients over on Bull Street. I mean, it was horrendous. And Majeska went to bat talking about it. And as Governor McNair said, <laughs> publicizing it and arguing on television and radio and writing editorials and things of that sort to bring attention to it and to demand changes. I do have uh, one quick question for you about the documentary, uh, which I always enjoy until we watch it in class. But uh, I am curious, is there, because you mentioned earlier that there was a lot that was looking cutting from the floor. Um, is there, could you say just one thing that you wish could have made the documentary but didn't have time to put in a documentary? about Simpkins' lives, the movements he was part of, anything at all? Um, well, yes, I mentioned, for example, the Orangeburg Massacre thing, but just talking about 
her actual leadership and involvement when, well, the mental health thing would have been one that I think is really, really important that no one gives her credit for. Um, I don't think people understand that Majeska worked really hard with the integration of the university. I mean, she credits her sister, Rebecca, who was the mother of Henri Monti, with being the spearhead. And perhaps she, she were, I think that's the proper <laughs> pronunciation of English. But uh, Majeska was right out there, but behind the scenes pushing. I think I wish that I could have shown more of her collaboration with Thurgood Marshall. I wish I could have shown the fact that when they were in the courtroom with Judge Wadey's wearing, Jessica was right there on the front row and passing notes to Marshall <laughs> and the other lawyers. I wish I could have shown her somehow huddling with all of these men. <laughs> <laughs> who get the credit for being, you know, that there, there's just, I, I, it was a matter of, do we just hit on these kind of important things or do we, you know, really show the, the, the fullness of her involvement in, in many things. Um, I wish I could have gotten more testimonials from real people that she helped mm -hmm. over the years. Um, I think Brett will tell you, even the homeless people here, mm -hmm. uh, coming by her house and sitting on her porch and, and she'd often feed them and, you know, and- <laughs> She wouldn't give any money, but she'd make a sandwich for them and yes. say, don't think I get, because I gave you a sandwich, I adopted you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing. She would go to the need. Now she didn't want you hanging out asking her panhandling. She didn't tolerate that, but she tried to help people. You know, and uh, I don't know that I was able to portray the personalness of her. Yeah. And that that's important to me that you understand. That lady had a big heart. Yeah. Did she ever see the documentary? And what yeah. was her reaction? Not only did she see it. <laughs> When I talk, I, I think I told you this story. Um, I'm not sure whether it was, well, I probably shouldn't put out dirty laundry out there, but I was having, I was having difficulty getting the documentary edited. Um, there was a vice president of production that did not, want me to finish this piece. Um, and I don't know whether that was personal against me or this competition against uh, the person who was, I was in the programming department and there was a competitiveness between them. And so he did very un <sighs> unfair things. Uh, for example, we had an editing suite at that time, the CMX editing suite, which was the most complex one of the time, but it was under the aegis of the production department. And so he determined that they needed to do maintenance during the period that I was signed up to edit and closed the day. And so it was closed for a couple of weeks and we were down to one week before we were supposed to premiere the show. And it was still closed. And he said, his comment was, I'd like to see what kind of tap dance you're gonna do when they tune in for this and it doesn't oh. air. Um, I was working with a wonderful editor, his name is Elaine Cooper mm -hmm. at the time. And we made a decision that that wasn't gonna happen. And so we would meet at eight o'clock at night and go in to the edit room and we would edit until 6 a.m. And that's the way that production- You made a way out of no way to make a way to make it a way out of no way. Okay. So I'm in the edit suite and it's like, it's Thursday night. The show is going to premiere on Sunday. We're in the edit suite and I look at something and I realize I'm not sure about the facts here. And I think, so I call Majeska. And it's like 10.30 at night. 
and how are you doing? And I said, oh, God, I wish I had a drink. <laughs> this is terrible. At quarter to midnight, the security guard comes into the edit suite, and he said, there's someone here to see you. Majeska, who drove this horrendous 1952 Buick that looked like a tank, <laughs> had driven over to ETV in the middle of the night to bring me a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> so, yes, she was very involved. She did see it, and um, she was very pleased. Yeah, she was pleased. Well, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you that Becky, who's there giggling, um, watched this movie before she really knew me, and she came to see me not long after. Oh, so we helped your love life. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's nodding. <laughs> Unintended consequence. <laughs> but that's good. That yeah. yeah that but, and that, that was important to me. That's also why I think it's important that the movie should still be Joan in her house. Her because stuff. it's her, you know, it, it's what she wants you to know about. Yeah. Yes. You, you, you get the impression, Joan. Yeah, so I, I think about how with like very powerful moral leaders like this, there's like two ways of dealing. You can either try to squash the memory or you can sort of declaw the memory, you know? So it claws the claw. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder, um, one, if Majeska Simpkins really left any wiggle room for people to try to do that, and two, um, if you've seen efforts to, like, I, I don't know, like in your, over the years, her memory and how it's been used or misused. You could probably answer that better than I. I will say this, until this past year, this film has not been on air very much because of the technology, because they say, you know, we're in HD now, and this is still, you know, it's the old format, and it's, it's not, it's too dirty looking for our air. You know, we can't do this. And so I've been arguing behind the scenes that, they, you know, it still needed to be shown. And recently they developed something called ETV Classics and have brought it back so that you could actually see it. Um, I don't know that I've seen outward efforts to, uh, to lessen her impact as, as much as just not dealing with presenting her it would be very so, difficult yeah. because of her long history of her mother being involved with the boys in 1905. She was raised as an internationalist with a socialist perspective, an anti imperialist perspective, from the beginning of her life in 1899. And so it'd be hard to do that. And she was not um, Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, who actually had some kind of secret subversion. She was up front about it. Yeah. And so it's harder to. Get away with that. Yeah, I don't know about that kind of suppression. I do think it's interesting that her life parallels that of Strom Thurmond. <laughs> and they never met. They never met. The story she told me, she was in the president's office at State College. You know mm -hmm. the same story? You know oh, when I mean? he came to visit? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's And story. Thurman was governor. And he comes up in the limo. Ms. Essa Simpkins is in the president's office on, talking about something. And the secretary comes in and says, the governor's here to see his daughter. Yeah. And that was, what, he was 40, in the 40s. He was governor. Yeah, that was in the 40s. But they didn't meet it, themselves. It, At least that's okay, my well, not understanding. That, not in that story, and I don't know otherwise, but yeah. she had certainly did trash Johnson, who was like right before Thurman. But that um, the, the question of Thurman having a black daughter was this known thing in the black community and i'm like we got to talk about this and this has told me a long time ago he did right by the girl we're not going to talk about it till he's gone mm -hmm. and he did he, he put it through college she'd go see him in, in washington and go in the office and it was like damn that's kind of like the old south or something where it was well and it was known that when um uh... Essie May was at State College that they would meet in the president's office. The president would vacate his office, and that is where um, they would communicate. And as you said, 
for the Black community, at least the Black community that I knew, that it was a non story when it was revealed. He did write my report. That yeah. was, those were her words. Yeah. But as far as Majeska and Strom were often on opposite <laughs> sides. And that's what I find so interesting that they were, you know, contemporaries and they're both in the public eye arguing these various issues, but they never, you know, they never debated, they never actually physically met. And she and Bob McNair never actually met either. The governor who said she confronted you in the media. Mm -hmm. um, when I was working on the documentary, I tried to engineer such a meeting. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> well, I have a question about something I saw for the first time tonight. Uh-oh. Go ahead. <laughs> um, you, it, it, Matthew Perry said that Briggs, uh, uh, Brown versus Board was the first case. He said that in your, in your movie. Mm -hmm. And Brown versus Board was not the first case. Mm -mm. The first, in terms of the Supreme Court cases, are named by the first one appearing on the docket. And that was Briggs. That's what he meant. No, it's Brown v. Board of Education. It should be Briggs because they are usually alphabetical. The chronology, well, we I have, and we'll share with you information <laughs> about. Jimmy Burns picking up the phone and calling the guy in Tennessee, Insane. Tennessee, no, um, Tennessee to, Topeka, calling the guy in Topeka that was the lawyer for the state saying, we want you to go first because Briggs would be first because it was filed in 48. Right. And so I keep hearing people, even in this new Cecil Williams thing about how people think maybe why isn't it that? Well, the reason it's not is Jimmy Burns. Right. Okay. That's true. Right. Yeah, and that's what he, when he said it, it was first, it's because of that, that it was put first. Okay, I'll watch the movie again. <laughs> <laughs> it was put first. You know what I thought you were going to say? One of the things that was killing me is when we use the Ku Klux Klan footage, all of the cars are too modern for the period. That was, I, I and said, that bugs the that heck out of me. Chevy. And, Yes, and it bugs the heck out of me. But at that time, that was the only footage I could well, find of the clay. Everybody will <laughs> certainly won't recognize this car. But that, that's what I thought you were going to go. No, Carol, no. you didn't do it. I took her to a clan fellow. Out, out, out by the airport with yeah. her on a big cross. She wanted to go show them she wasn't afraid of anybody. Amazing woman, that's all I can say. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. So I, I think that is as good a place for us to close out tonight's class with Brett talking about taking Marissa Simpson to a Klan rally. Uh, <laughs> but do not forget a couple of things. Number one, I do want to present to Beryl our, our gift for her parents this evening, a copy of the book. Justice Deferred, Race in the Supreme Court by Orville Vernon Burton and Armand Durfner. Great, excellent work, really important book. And speaking of Vernon Burton, um, we do have coming up this weekend, I think it's this Sunday, we have... Sunday is the 7th? Maybe yes, the yes, this Sunday is okay. the 7th of April. Uh, at 6.30, uh, we will have a deeper dive conversation with Vernon Burton about... Reconstruction in South Carolina, specifically the violent backlash to Reconstruction mm -hmm. that really shaped the state uh, from then on out, and also shaped the Constitution in some ways. Mm -hmm. That will be this Sunday at 6.30 uh, p.m. Uh, just FYI, Beryl mentioned this earlier. Okay. If the University of South Carolina is in the Women's National Championship game on Sunday, that will be at 3 p.m. So the game will be over by the deeper dive time. <laughs> just FYI, I'm just letting you know that right now. But we look forward to seeing you on uh, April the 7th. And then the following day, Monday, is our next class. Uh, that will take us through Reconstruction up until the Constitution of 1895, written and supported by a dear friend of the class, Ben Tillman. So uh, we'll be talking about Reconstruction this weekend and this coming Monday. Yeah.
Dr. Gallman has his next dive at four o'clock, April 7th. So, and he's been gracious enough to switch with Vernon, Vernon because he couldn't be at four. And so our guest presenters are in such high demand that we have to like reschedule them right before their appearances. So thank you, Dr. Goldman, and thank you, Dr. Vernon Martin. Vernon, one of the things that he's going to talk about that is new is uh, that we've been talking about is the, the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And that was passed, what, 1868? Yes. Okay. And that um, that's there's an insurrection clause in there. The only time that ever had ever been used for somebody that tried to um, form an insurrection to overthrow the local government was in South Carolina. And there's six or nine counties, I'm going to have them listed before the thing, where they actually sent in federal troops. This is it's 70, it was early in the in the game. It was like 71. Right. So mm -hmm. Reconstruction isn't beaten down completely until 77. So this is early battles. And the Klan is taking over. I remember Pickens and O'Connor in these northern counties. And they send the federal troops in uh, to uh, squash the insurrection. And Vernon just wrote a world-class amicus brief that he filed with the U.S. Supreme Court that was co-sponsored by 30 uh, emeritus and, and very important southern historians from all the colleges you could think of in the South that signed this amicus brief on the case where Colorado judges said that Trump did insurrection, he can't be on our ballot here, and Vernon organized this mm -hmm. amicus brief that was filed that the court just ruled on that, oh no, you can't do that. But Vernon is swimming in some really rapid waters, lifting up the history of things that he knows more about than most anyone, and he will be here he will be zooming from Clemson uh, this coming Sunday at so six thirty. Yes, and as a USC grad, I can say he is one of the few good things about Clemson University. I can't. Oh. I can't. It's a joke. This is a joke. It's but a what joke. you also should say is you may want to extend your class period because Vernon does. <laughs> uh, we have a, a interview process set up for Dr. Oh, okay. You're welcome. Please, you're encouraged to come. Yes, uh, and Vernon himself has asked me to grant him in before, so that he, he is aware of this as well. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, have a good evening, and I'll see you this Sunday. Mm -hmm.